It's a mystery continent at the bottom of the world and the largest single mass of ice on Earth. For longer than humans have walked the planet, ice has dominated Antarctica. But what about the future? Ice melts from this continent, sea level goes up. As Earth gets warmer, what will happen to Antarctica? We're going into uncertain lands, uncertain future. How will the Earth respond? Today, a pioneering team is searching for answers with a bold new plan and a revolutionary new machine. No one has ever drilled through an ice shelf, and they present these challenges. They must drill down nearly a mile and more than 20 million years deep into Antarctica's ancient history. In this unforgiving place, it's never been done before. It's quite amazing when you think about where we are and what we're doing. Anything can go wrong at any minute. The stakes are high because the secret to Earth's future lies buried in Antarctica's past. Right now on NOVA, the coldest, windiest, driest, and most desolate landscape on the planet, with few permanent residents except penguins and seals. This frosty continent appears locked in a perpetual ice age. A colossal cloak of ice covers almost every inch of land, and in some places, the ice is so thick and so heavy it depresses the Earth's crust almost half a mile. Some people call it Earth's freezer, but scientists call Antarctica the ice. Antarctica plays a fundamental role in the way the Earth functions. For polar researchers, Antarctica is a giant laboratory more than one and a half times the size of the United States and home to 90% of all the ice in the world. Anything that happens down here, anything that changes, will affect the rest of the world. Most people don't think that change in Antarctica matters to them. But when we look at New York City, and we look that it's in front of the ocean, it matters. What would happen if all of Antarctica's ice were to melt? The Antarctica melts, sea level goes up. 12 stories in New York City. Sea levels would rise by more than 150 feet. Flooding coastal cities, displacing hundreds of millions of people. That would be a change that you could see from space. Earth would look different. In any case, even a loss of just 10% of Antarctica's ice would be catastrophic. It would raise the sea level over there in Manhattan, about 19 feet, right up along the edge. Big sections of Brooklyn would be underwater. Certainly the Mediterranean and some of my favorite cities like Venice would look very different. Tens of millions of people would have to be relocated. It'd be almost a different, different planet. If sea level changes and the climate around the coastal regions change, it's going to affect the climate where you live, it's going to affect the things you can you can grow, it's going to affect how you, how you live. There may be a list of things in store that come as a result of raising sea levels that we haven't even thought about yet. Could this be our fate? Is Antarctica heading for a major meltdown? If so, it may happen over centuries but it could already be starting because the climate is changing. And it's changing because burning fossil fuels has increased the level of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. Today, 
we have something that's completely man-made, and that is the addition of carbon dioxide being put into the atmosphere by humanity, by us. Carbon dioxide is a greenhouse gas. It prevents the sun's heat from escaping. I'm in the Brooklyn Botanic Garden in a greenhouse. Greenhouses, they're basically like heat motels where the sun's rays can come in and they get trapped inside the greenhouse. They can't get out. So like glass in a greenhouse, gases like carbon dioxide trap solar energy in our atmosphere. But now, those levels are increasing. The result is our Earth is now warming up. And the ice is melting, both in Antarctica and the Arctic. In the north, there's two clear signals. In the Arctic Ocean, you have lots of floating ice and not sticking around through the summer. That's one sign of it getting warmer. The other sign, the edges of the Greenland ice sheet are changing. And the loss of Greenland's ice is now speeding up. In August 2010, an iceberg four times the size of Manhattan broke off the edge of Greenland. But Antarctica has nearly 10 times as much ice as Greenland. And in the past decade alone, rising temperatures have caused giant pieces of coastal ice to shrink or crumble. Polar researchers feared that this could be just the beginning of a chain reaction. But have Antarctica's ice sheets ever collapsed before? That's what an international team of geodetectives wants to find out. Here we actually have some running water, some melt water coming out of the ice. To get a more precise picture of Antarctica's future, they plan to dig deep for answers in the past with a giant drill. By drilling into areas around Antarctica, we're able to perceive a history that has an impact for where we're headed as a planet. Antarctica was not always locked in a deep freeze. 160 million years ago, it was part of an enormous supercontinent closer to the equator. At the time, Earth was much warmer than today, and fossil evidence suggests this giant landmass was a tropical habitat teeming with dinosaurs. Eventually, the supercontinent broke apart, and Antarctica drifted south. As Earth was getting colder, falling carbon dioxide levels and powerful ocean currents cooled the isolated continent even further. And then, around 34 million years ago, ice slowly began to form. It would take millions of years for Antarctica to finally lock into a deep freeze. And during that time, it remained warm enough for plant life to survive. Evidence of that was recently unearthed in a relatively ice-free valley in the interior. Here, geologists Alan Ashworth and Adam Lewis find a remarkable fossil. Oh, a leaf. Is that a leaf? There's a leaf right there. Hey! That leaf fell into the mud maybe 20 million years ago. That may be the best leaf yet. That's a sweet leaf. And then they find something extraordinary. This is like a, a peat, peat moss. And then if we, you know, take, tease some of this out, they're like freeze dried. Under the microscope, these brittle mosses are in pristine condition. These moss fossils are not rock, but actual plant tissue, the last vestiges of vegetation from a time when Antarctica was still warm. They were found under a layer of volcanic ash that dates back millions of years. This is the original moss tissue, and even the cells are preserved in these fossils. These plants were flash frozen when Antarctica plummeted into a deep freeze that preserved them until today. It's mind-boggling. The only way is to say the climate remained very, very cold, it remained very, very dry, and it did not warm up for even relatively short periods of time in this location. Otherwise, these things are gone. Now, as Earth is heating up, what will happen to Antarctica? Will it melt, raising sea levels all over the planet? How sensitive is this frozen land to the temperature changes we currently face? But before researchers can investigate in Antarctica, last-minute testing is taking place here 
over 2,000 miles away in the countryside of New Zealand with a brand new drill. Yeah, it's a shakedown. We've got a few leaking connections and things that don't quite fit as well as they need to. A little bit of modifications required. Pretty common with a brand new piece of equipment. Weighing in at a whopping 40 tons, this mechanized marvel is as heavy as a humpback whale and just as large. Towering some five stories high, the giant rig will soon dwarf everything in sight except the ice. This will be the largest drill rig in Antarctica that's used on land. And this mammoth rig can drill in more than one place. That's because it's mounted on a sled. I think it probably is unusual. All of the equipment is on sledges, so in Antarctica we pull it all with big bulldozers. It's been specially designed to drill from the ice in order to extract hidden secrets from beneath Antarctica itself. This unique multinational enterprise is called Andrill, the Antarctic Drilling Project. For team leader David Harwood, it's a dream come true. As a scientist, there's a passion. There's a passion that comes in trying to figure this out, trying to identify what has been the past history of the ice sheet, and wondering what the future might hold. Soon, the giant drill will be dismantled and ready for a long sea voyage. We'll then start the final screening process, and that's, we'll get you to take your extreme cold weather jackets off. But now, the Andrill team gathers at Christchurch, New Zealand, for the six-hour flight to Antarctica in a C-17 cargo plane, jam-packed with people and gear. Their flight passes over the Trans-Antarctic Mountains, which divide the continent into two regions, with colossal glaciers called ice sheets blanketing both. The giant East Antarctic ice sheet is 10 times the size of the West. It's frozen firmly to bedrock, high above the sea. And in some places, the ice towers almost three miles into the sky. The smaller West Antarctic ice sheet is less stable. That's because it rests on land well below sea level, and it extends hundreds of miles over the ocean in floating ice shelves. It's likely East and West Antarctica will respond very differently to a warming world. The Andrill team touches down in the West on an icy runway at McMurdo Station, the largest U.S. research base in Antarctica. As David Harwood and Richard Levy step out onto the ice, the first thing they notice is the weather. This is a bit chilly, but it's beautiful. It's good to be back. It's October, springtime, and it's minus 20 degrees. It's the earliest I've ever been down to Antarctica, and it's very cold. When the wind picks up, it's rather an unpleasant place to be working. When the wind isn't blowing and the sun's shining, it's actually really quite nice, but very cold. But even a sunny afternoon can turn nasty at a moment's notice. It's a beautiful day! Come on, guys! McMurdo Station has been a vital hub of research for over half a century. What began as a tiny outpost has over the years grown into a small town. McMurdo houses a population of 200 people year round. But during the research season, it becomes home base for over a thousand. Every year, McMurdo supports scores of research projects, providing lab facilities, food and supplies, and survival training for teams of scientists who will head out to remote field camps. This season, those numbers include the Andrill team of over 50 technicians and researchers from the US, New Zealand, Germany, and Italy. Andrill is funded by their governments and the National Science Foundation. There's probably a week at least of work in McMurdo where we have to get all of our gear sorted out, getting everything we need in order to be able to work and survive out in the field. 
As they gather supplies for more than a month on the ice, one item is in high demand. Sugar actually heats your body. It gives you quick energy, especially if you're like freezing and we expect to be very cold. We don't really know how much chocolate is enough. We can take up to 560 candy bars, but I'm looking at this and I'm already getting queasy. I'm like, oh, I don't know if I can eat this or not. Hey, David. As Andrew researchers prepare for life in the field, they join hundreds of other scientists fanning out across Antarctica, and many are focused on the same question. Could Antarctica be headed for a meltdown? Over here is Mount Boreas. We're going to have a lot of scientists working together. There is a little bit of volcanic ash. And you know, challenging each other's theories, challenging what we know. Look at that. As a community, we're going to find the answers. But the continent won't give up its secrets easily. The stark beauty of Antarctica masks a treacherous nature. More than 70% of all the fresh water in the world is harbored here. But most of that water is frozen. And with less precipitation than the Sahara, Antarctica is the driest desert on Earth. Raging winds of up to 200 miles per hour sometimes blast the frozen terrain, where temperatures can drop to 100 degrees below zero. Only during the short Antarctic summer can most researchers gather precious scientific data from this giant mystery continent. Come on, then. Two, nine, two for drift. Copy. Wait, ride. That's all that. And um, the beat. A four-hour flight and 400 miles from McMurdo is the center of the West Antarctic Ice Sheet. And for one team, this is the best way to find out about the past. This is the side of a snow pit. It's a thin wall between two pits. The other side is open so the light can shine through. And you can really see the different layers in the pit. So this is one year's worth of snow accumulation. And there's a second year's worth of snow accumulation here below it. Two years of record right here in the snow pit. Of course, we want to go back a lot further in time than that. In order to do that, we can't just use shovels and chainsaws like we did here, so we have to use a drill. Ken Taylor's team is drilling through ice. Their goal is to gather samples from the nearly two mile thick West Antarctic ice sheet. And the deeper they go, the further back in time they travel. Here we're at about 480 meters deep right now. This is right around the time when Jesus lived. It's right about zero AD, right when BC years turned into AD years. These ice cores contain tiny bubbles of ancient atmosphere that were trapped each year as the snow was compressed into ice. Oh, nice bubbles in this one. That's ancient air in there. When we crush samples like this, that'll get the gas out of there and we can sample the ancient atmosphere. We can also get a record of how things like temperature and sea ice changed in the past. And by combining these different records, we can understand how the climate system has operated in the past. But the ice record, valuable as it is, only goes back about 800,000 years, a tiny fraction of geologic time. To get a more complete picture of Antarctica's climate history, you have to drill farther back in time. And that's what the Andril team is trying to do. They want to paint a picture of Antarctica as it changed from warm to cold millions of years ago. In order to do that, Andril will have to drill deep into the Earth but finding the right location is a major challenge on a continent covered by ice. And even in those few places where the ice has receded, it's still not easy. Andrill's David Harwood and Richard Levy are searching for places to drill. But as they fly over a field of rubble, they see that gathering evidence for a chronological history is not possible here. Something has stirred things up, and that something is the ice itself. That's because ice moves. For tens of millions of years, glaciers have slowly scoured the land, gobbling up rocks and debris and spreading them all across the landscape in random order. 
This we call glacial paleontology. Some call it garbage pile paleontology because we're looking and sorting through these moraines to try to get pieces of information that the ice sheet has brought to us. A moraine is the chaotic accumulation of rocks and debris deposited by glacial movement. This one here actually has abundant shell fossils. This shell, brought here by a glacier, comes from a time when the continent was warmer and water ran through these valleys. This landscape is a treasure trove of Antarctica's climate history. But the ice has scrambled all the clues. We're looking at a jigsaw puzzle. Yet there's one place where the evidence remains intact. That's in the seafloor beneath the Antarctic ice shelf, where the glacial movement has also deposited layer after layer in chronological order. Drilling gives us an opportunity to get a serial history in time. Each layer goes back in time, and we know that a rock above was younger than a rock below, so we can put it into a history. The Andrill team aims to drill through the Antarctic ice and the sea below. Then, like a straw thrust through a layer cake, they'll bore deep into the ocean floor in order to recover millions of years of rock and mud that trace Antarctica's climate history. Even after ice began to form in Antarctica around 34 million years ago, the continent remained warm enough for plant life to survive, a lot like areas of New Zealand today, where ice can be found bordered by trees and plants. But when did Antarctica plunge into a solid deep freeze? And how did it happen? Was it gradual or abrupt? Will the story of how Antarctica changed from greenhouse to ice house reveal new clues about the continent's climate future and our own? Charlie, Charlie, I am David Harwood. The Andrill team will spend the next few weeks searching for drilling locations from the surface of the ice. But David Harwood remains focused on what lies below. When I'm driving across there, I'm always thinking about what's beneath us. I'm over about 15 feet of ice, and over that I'm over about 1,500 feet of water, and then into the sediments below that. Here at the bottom of the world, the sun never sets in the summer. And as night blends into day, the work begins in earnest. The team heads out to McMurdo Sound, a place where the ocean freezes annually, creating a precarious platform of floating sea ice that will only last a few months. We're standing right now in the southern part of McMurdo Sound. Seasonally, this region will break out. The sea ice that we're standing on will melt out. It's now strong enough, perhaps 20 feet beneath us is the thickness of ice, and then 1,500 feet of water beneath us as well just to be sure they're in the right place. Fire in the hole. The team blasts powerful sound waves through the sea ice and into the seafloor below. The result is a sonic street map of layer after layer of rock and mud, each one representing a different era of the past. By looking into the past, you can maybe project into the future how dynamic has been the behavior of the ice sheets? Have they been static and slowly changing? How active a player have they been? Finally, it's time to tow the giant drill out onto the ice. To ensure that the weight of the rig isn't supported by the sea ice alone. Divers attach flotation devices to the drilled pipe. And at the end of that pipe is a whirling tool with a unique cutting edge, a drill bit made of diamonds that can bore through almost everything in its path. The diamond core system that we have, it's almost like melting the core down through the rocks. It just cuts through whatever's there. If you hit a, a big boulder, you'll just end up with a cylinder of that boulder, and it'll just keep going. Now the real drilling begins. There's not a minute to waste. 
because the Antarctic research season is so short. The crews work around the clock to recover cores of rock that trace Antarctica's ancient past. The powerful drill bores down over three quarters of a mile, bringing up 12 feet of core at a time, each foot averaging a thousand years of climate history. It's an astonishing feat. It's quite amazing when you think about where we are and what we're doing. We've got a drill rig, a 60 ton to 90 ton with all the equipment on it, drill rig sitting behind us here on eight meters of sea ice above 380 meters of water. And then we're drilling down into the seafloor below that with a three to four inch diameter pipe that's turning round and round like a, a piece of spaghetti hanging down through the water and into the ground and it's wobbling around a bit and, and we're turning around and, and, and bringing core up from deep within the earth. Anything can go wrong at any minute with this process. And all too soon, it does. Sometimes even a drill bit made of diamonds can run into trouble. We haven't been getting particularly good quality core. And we're suspecting that the drill bit has been damaged. In places it's a little bit narrower than it should be for the size of the diamond bits. And that means we have to pull all of our pipe out about 1,700 metres and replace the bit and then put the pipe back down the hole and that's going to take us about 24 hours to 36 hours. Removing and replacing nearly a mile of pipe is no easy task, especially when it's your job to change it all out, piece by piece. But for other members of the Andrill team, it's a welcome break. In an extreme environment like Antarctica, nobody's on a diet. Your body is working so hard to stay warm, packing away 6,000 calories or more a day is not an indulgence, it's a necessity. Is there coffee on the, uh, on the stove? And because Antarctica is drier than the hottest desert, dehydration is a constant concern. And keeping the drill up and running is another. Finally, after a day and a half of hard work, the new bid is in place. And drilling is back on track. They recover a 12-foot length of core, wrapped in a protective cover. Workers carefully carry it back to the lab to be examined. When they crack it open, it's in perfect condition. This mud and rock is more valuable than gold because each core is a time machine. We're currently down at a depth of about 440 meters. That's about a quarter mile down, corresponding to a time at least 15 million years ago, when Antarctica was still warm. As the cores are recovered, each section is sliced lengthwise, x-rayed, and scanned in labs at the drill site and back at McMurdo. These cores came out of the ground three days ago. They were split yesterday. They were imaged yesterday. Sedimentologists worked the night shift 12 hours describing these cores millimeter by millimeter, looking at the, the color, size ratios, any kind of structure they see in a core, trying to understand how these sediments were deposited. Each core tells a story depending on its texture, color, and contents and some of those stories are spectacular. We're seeing some uh, macrofossils, some large shells. These shells are evidence of warmer times, even as Antarctica is icing up. This is one of the most spectacular fossils found within Andrew this season. This is a scallop. Now, this kind of scallop simply do not live in extreme polar waters. And there are other clues, some of them nearly invisible. Hidden inside these cores are shells of microscopic algae called diatoms. For andrel climate detectives, these tiny diatoms create a highly revealing picture of the past. 
because not all diatoms are alike. Some species are adapted to colder conditions, while others flourish in warmer waters. We use them as biological markers, index of different environmental conditions, cold or warm, frozen waters or open ocean waters. Again, the Andrel team examines cores from around 15 million years ago. They find smooth green sands containing diatoms that thrived in relatively warm water, confirming this was a time before Antarctica finally froze over. This is very well-defined warm period. Iceberg-free waters, open waters where diatoms are growing and thriving. You can see this persisted for quite some time. A picture is beginning to form of a long period of transition, starting 34 million years ago when a cooling climate led to the formation of ice. But even so, conditions remained relatively mild. But when did Antarctica finally slip into a deep freeze? The answer lies in cores from around 14 million years ago. Instead of smooth and green, these cores are rocky and gray, and some contain diatoms that thrived in cold glacial waters. This amazing discovery reveals a rapid change from cool to frozen. It fills in what has always been a blank page in Antarctica's climate history. Next season, they'll attack another crucial question. After Antarctica froze 14 million years ago, did the ice ever melt? Or has it remained a frozen wilderness right up until today? That answer will have to wait. Cracks in the sea ice tell the team it's time to return to base. We've seen the ice break in quite a bit in the last month, but it's not broken in anywhere, anywhere further south than it is right now. We can only be on this site for so long before the sea ice starts to melt, before the conditions change, and, and for safety reasons, we have to get off the sea ice. The precarious sea ice of West Antarctica may come and go with the seasons. But what about the giant East Antarctic ice sheet? A mountain of ice so high, it covers mountains. This is like an MRI of the ice sheet. Some places it's really thick, two miles thick, and pretty flat and boring. But then there are other places where what we discovered were hidden mountain ranges the size of the Appalachians but totally hidden by the huge East Antarctic ice sheet. There's 10 times as much ice in the east as in the west. But a small portion of the east has almost no ice at all. It's an unearthly location that defies the very image of Antarctica. These are the dry valleys, cold, barren, and except for a few scientists, almost completely devoid of life. The landscape is so alien, NASA has used it as a test site for space programs. It's a fantastic place. You can't find this anywhere else on Earth. It's closest analog is the surface of Mars. Mullins Valley is the ultimate remote field camp. It serves as home base for a pioneering band of glaciologists led by Dave Marchant. Marchant and his team are conducting research the rugged, old-fashioned way. They'll live in tents and won't be picked up for two months. They need to be self-sufficient, and for the most part, they like it that way. Good day. Burritos. The good thing about working out here is that it's actually a double-edged sword. You come out here, you have no contact with the outside world, no email, no real telephone contact, so you can totally immerse yourself in the science. And that allows you to think 24 hours a day about what you're doing. The other side of that is, is you have no idea what's going on outside. Hi. 
At yeah. the beginning of the season, um, I didn't like it when uh, you would breathe and the frost would form on the outside of the sleeping bag, but it's warmed <laughs> up now and it's a little more, more comfortable in the morning. <laughs> Small setups like we have, which are uh, helicopter supported, are, are isolated. They're among the most isolated in the region. And uh, as a result, we have to check in daily with McMurdo. I'm trying to heat the batteries up so that we can get a signal out. Right now, um, there appears to be no satellite coverage and the batteries are a little bit cold. So I'm trying to warm it up. Sometimes you have to contort your body in various ways to, to get the signal. No, we're not, uh, we don't have enough signal yet. Well, here we go. We've got something that might work. Mac Ops, this is Gulf 054 Mullins Valley. Uh, we have seven on board and all is well. Over. Ah, we lost transmission. This valley holds an incredible record. This area is so dry and so cold that the landscape is pristine. The rocks we see here are millions of years old. Marchant believes that little has changed here for millions of years. What to me is exciting is that we're walking on an ancient landscape. Imagine living 10 million years ago in Antarctica. This is what you'd see, exactly as it is today, hardly modified at all. But when Marchand's team drilled beneath this rubble, they found something totally unexpected. A hidden glacier that extends hundreds of feet below the surface. This is, in my opinion, the oldest dated Barry Glacier on Earth. Is it all out? Yep, it's all out. Are you getting it? Yeah. The evidence comes from volcanic ash. The dry valleys are surrounded by extinct volcanoes that erupted millions of years ago. We're finding ash deposits on top of ice. Ash dates are coming back as old as 8 million years. And according to Marchant, this volcanic ash shows this hidden glacier, once frozen, has never melted. This volcanic ash that erupted from a volcano and has been sitting there for millions of years. It shows no chemical alteration, which you'd expect if there were any amount of liquid meltwater over that duration. The fact that it's dry and pristine tells me it's always been here, which is incredible. Equally astonishing, and just 300 miles away, there appears to be a completely different picture. Exploring East Antarctica, closer to the South Pole, Andrew's David Harwood found leaf fossils and pieces of wood. Surprisingly, according to Harwood, these date to a relatively recent time, when Antarctica was not only warmer than today, there were plants and trees. This is a piece of southern beach. This wood is not fossilized in the sense that it is petrified. It could still burn. To find the wood and leaves together is pretty phenomenal. It's really phenomenal for Antarctica, particularly for Antarctica in the uh, in this time period, about four million years ago. This season, the drill is set up to find evidence of what happened in Antarctica during this period, three to five million years ago. It's a time known as the Pliocene. Now, what's important about that is that the Pliocene was globally warmer than today the same temperatures as our Earth may be headed for at the end of the century, if climate change predictions are correct. If we go back three to five million years into the geological past, we know that that was a time when Earth's climate was warmer than it is today, perhaps by three to four degrees. So it's the best example we have of where the climate's heading in the next hundred years. The drill's new location is on the giant Ross ice shelf which extends out and over the ocean. It's the largest ice shelf in the world. And it helps hold back the massive Antarctic ice sheet from flowing into the sea. These ice shelves are very important. What they do is hold back the flow of ice that's actually trying to flow out into the ocean. We call that buttressing. If warming oceans cause the Ross ice shelf to break up and melt into the sea, the West Antarctic ice sheet would eventually follow right behind.
The Andril team is looking for the answer to a critical question. When Earth was warming during the Pliocene, what happened to the ice? Did the Ross ice shelf melt, taking the giant ice sheets with it? Drilling on an ice shelf brings with it a unique set of technological challenges. including constant problems with mud and water. Unlike drilling through sea ice, which is just 26 feet thick, the ice shelf here is 400 feet. We're looking at at least doubling or trying to double our capability below the sea floor and penetrate to 1,000 meters or better into the sea floor. But that's only the beginning. No one has ever drilled through an ice shelf and they present these challenges. The ice shelves, they float up and down with the tide, so you've got to deal with this vertical elevation change. They move sideways, they flow, so eventually your drill pipe's going to get bent. Can the drill bore through a thick layer of ice that's constantly moving without breaking or getting yanked out of the sea floor? To confront this unique challenge head on, the Andril team invents a new tool, a hot water drill. This marvel of engineering is a moving ring of heat that blasts jets of steaming water to melt a wide hole so the drill can operate freely through 400 feet of shifting ice. And once again, time is so precious, the team must work around the clock, not only retrieving cores, but also analyzing them. It's 2 a.m., but you wouldn't know it. Geologists are busy logging cores like it's early afternoon. We're laying out the cores in a proper sequence from top, the very highest point in the core, all the way to the very slowest point in the core here. An 80-foot core that dates back about 3 million years is closely examined. It contains microfossils of single-celled animals known as forums. They're from the crucial warm period called the Pliocene. And these tiny shells are precise indicators of ocean temperature. These guys are about the size of a grain of sand. Because the same species lived through time, we can use the chemistry of modern examples to allow us to calibrate, if you like, the chemistry of the ancient examples. What Gav's doing here is he's measuring the amount of two metals, magnesium and calcium, that are in the ocean and get incorporated into the shell of the foram when it's growing in that ocean. And that process is dependent on the temperature of the ocean. So if we know the magnesium, we know the calcium, we can determine the temperature of the ocean at the time that foram lived. And because of that, Andrew researchers can now calculate Antarctic water temperatures during the Pliocene. What this is telling us is temperatures were three to four, perhaps five degrees above present. Even just one degree rise in ocean temperatures in the waters surrounding Antarctica will attack and begin to melt the ice shelves from below very quickly. The air temperatures will stay cold enough to keep things frozen at the surface, but what we're worried about is the ice being attacked from beneath, not from above. And the cores revealed that this is what happened during the Pliocene, when global climate was warming. But they display even more change than expected, revealing not only a patchwork of glacial rubble, but also smooth mud from open seas, indicating that ice both froze and then melted many times. There's a really important change right here. This interval shows us uh, quite a dramatic change in the environment. There was ice and then there was no ice. The ice sheet has gone backwards and forwards. It's advanced and it's retreated. As they examine core after core from the Pliocene, they continue to see surprising signs of change. The results of the drilling are simply spectacular. They give us a picture of a dynamic ice sheet coming and going regularly more than 60 times. What we're seeing in this record is telling us that Antarctica is not just a benign spectator, it's a player. What this means is while it was generally warm during the Pliocene, there were also brief periods of cooling, 
and the ice was exquisitely sensitive to even small changes in climate. Just a few degrees could tip the scale from ice to no ice. So what's in store for our future? As Earth continues to warm, how much Antarctic ice will melt? And how high will sea levels rise? Andrel scientists turn to computer models by Rob DeCanto and Dave Pollard. We developed these climate models based on our best understanding of the physics of the climate system, and in this case, ice sheets. And now, information from Andrel is added to the climate model. This is a computer model simulation of the Antarctic ice sheet over the last several million years and covers a good chunk of the interval that was recovered by the Andrel sediment core. So we're looking for the same kind of behavior in our models that we're seeing in the geological record. As the model simulates the warming periods of the Pliocene, all of the ice shelves disappear, followed by the entire West Antarctic ice sheet and edges of the east. And as temperatures change, the ice refreezes and melts again and again. And that's important because the changes in the ice sheet that we're seeing here reflect pretty significant changes in sea level. According to DeCanto's model, sea levels rose about 23 feet during the Pliocene. Temperatures back then were three to five degrees higher than now. Just what's projected to take place by the end of the century. But there's a lag time in the way ice responds that may delay the impact for hundreds, if not thousands of years. Regardless, coastal cities all over the world would be at risk, potentially displacing millions. We would be remapping places like Boston and New York, the Bay Area, not to mention, of course, places like Louisiana, Miami, New Orleans, of course. But even that might not be the worst case scenario. Things were very similar to today in terms of our climate. Tim Nash brings Rob DeCanto to New Zealand to look at a possibility that's even more frightening. This is the first time I've seen the actual direct evidence for what the models are doing. You're seeing a deepening sea level rise up through here. We're going to look at some rocks that are the same age as rocks we've drilled in Antarctica that give us the record of global sea level changes. Here along the Rangitiki River, tectonic forces have raised the land and the river has cut into the earth to expose layer after layer of sediment that once was the sea floor. What they find are shells dated to the warming era of the Pliocene. These shells provide a way to chart sea level in the past because some of these species still exist today. Many of these shells you see in here actually live today. So they live around the coastline and we know the water depth they live in today. So by breaking them out of these rocks and identifying them, we can say the depth they were living here over three million years ago. Because these shellfish live on the sea floor and can only survive in water at specific depths, they suggest that sea levels in the Pliocene were much higher than even the computer models predict. This is really it, Rob. This is where we would say we have the evidence for sea level being up to as much as 20 metres above present. That's over 60 feet. In order for sea level to have risen that high, an enormous amount of ice must have melted. And this raises a startling possibility that a large part of the vast East Antarctic ice sheet melted along with the West. And if it melted once, could it melt again? That could be a very bad thing because that would actually produce a contribution to future sea level change that we really haven't been thinking about. This presents an even more dangerous and unpredictable picture of Antarctica. What's been surprising is 
Even geologists thought that glaciers and ice sheets were these large static features, which we would never really see change in our lifetime. But glacial processes are no longer quite as glacial. Things are moving faster than we had thought. What's driving these changes are rising levels of greenhouse gases. In the next five years, greenhouse gas levels will be like they were in the Pliocene. But we're not just going back to the Pliocene. Some of the projections put CO2 levels at twice the concentrations of the Pliocene by the end of the next century. We're essentially going back to the time of the dinosaurs when there was very little ice on the planet and there were forests covering Antarctica. And signs of change are already here. Scientists were completely caught by surprise when in 2002, the Larsen ice shelf shattered apart without warning in just a few weeks. And today, the Wilkins ice shelf, a block of ice approximately the size of Connecticut, barely hangs on. I would say it's inevitable that West Antarctica will disappear. How long it will take East Antarctica to engage is something that's, that's not yet known. In the coming years, the Andrew team will continue to explore Antarctica's climate history in order to gain valuable insight into Earth's future. With each new core, we gain new knowledge about a continent that's always been shrouded in mystery. But its fate remains very much tied to our own.